Two major international powers are wrestling for influence in one of Africa's poorest yet potentially richest countries, the Central African Republic. Well, Russia and former colonial ruler France are involved as the government confronts increased rebel activity. What is it that those two countries want? This is Roundtable. Hello and a warm welcome from me, David Foster. You know, aside from the international dimensions to this, there is the human cost. Civilians dead in the crossfire and thousands of people internally displaced, many of them fleeing the country. The issue is how to prevent a civil war. The Central African Republic has been in turmoil since a violent takeover of power in 2013. A political agreement was signed by the CAR and 14 armed groups in February of 2019 and raised hopes of peace. But violence has continued and December's elections were a catalyst for a new crisis. On one side, the government led by President Faustin Archange Touadera, who was re-elected for a second term in the recent vote. On the other, a coalition of rebel groups allied to former President François Bozizé. After he was prevented from running in the election by a top court, rebels launched attacks in an effort to derail the voting. The United Nations says that more than 200,000 people were forced to flee their homes, with around half of them crossing into neighboring countries like the Democratic Republic of Congo. I want clean water, medicine, food and clothes to protect me. Something to sleep on, a sheet, blankets, and cooking utensils. I really miss that. The picture is further complicated by the presence of outside powers. There's a UN mission in CAR, while Rwanda and Russia have sent troops at the government's request. France, the country's former colonial ruler, has carried out military flyover missions. The concern now is that civil war could break out. But is the presence of European powers making things worse? Well, let the conversation begin. For this discussion, we are joined out of Dakar, uh, Senegal. Paul Simon Andy joins us from there, head of the Conflict Prevention and Risk Analysis Division of the Institute for Security Studies. Then we head to Oxford, where we see Samuel Ramani, researcher in international relations at the University of Oxford, currently writing a book on Russia's foreign and security policy towards Africa. And then we go to the east coast of the United States, Maryland, USA. Eugene Pehua Pelema is therefore a Central African Republic analyst, and he'll be talking about what's happening to his fellow countrymen and women. But first of all, if I could come to you, uh, Paul Simon, and ask you about France's position in all of this. I I'm rather confused. Are they on the side of Bozizé, the former president, banned from running in the election, or are they on the side of the government, or perhaps a little bit of both? I think France is as confused as you itself. Uh, the reality is that um, uh, France has a, uh, a position where the country, the government says they just um, support the peace process. Uh, it's difficult. The, France has been supporting the, the current government, the process, just like other international actors. Uh, so France has been uh, insisting on meat. Uh, but uh, the truth is also that the arrival of a new actor, namely Russia, has confused France by uh, the, uh, the, uh, the way Russia came, the way Russia was able to, to, to take new positions within the security apparatus of the country, uh, surprised France and some other Western countries to the um, extent that actually France is a bit confused, has lost uh, some positions in its former colony, a country where um, it wasn't used to have uh, competition from other actors, particularly those in the Security Council of the United Nations. OK, so it is confusing. It's not just me. But I'm wondering if France is simply waiting to see which way the cards fall. It's only going to pick a winner once it knows who that winner is. That's the probably the wisest uh, position, let things uh, happen and then go with the winning team. Uh, 
but in reality, what France does now is just to support also the international, uh, the UN peace operation that is uh, currently in the CAR, uh, MINUSCA, uh, and try to, uh, uh, to also support the regional processes to help uh, get the country out of the, the crisis. France hasn't shown any particular leadership in the, in the country since uh, the French operation Sangaris left uh, the country a couple of years ago. Uh, so uh, in that sense, we can actually say that France is in a yeah. kind of a deadlock now in the country. OK, um, that was a few years ago, and that was when Russia stepped in, took advantage of what appeared to be a little bit of a vacuum. Um, Samuel, what is Russia's interest in the country? Is it purely financial? So Russia stepped into Central African Republic in 2016 after the end of Operation Sangaras, and it saw it as an easy access, convenient way to gain a broader strategic foothold in Central Africa. So by establishing a military foothold with the deployment of Wagner Group PMCs, they figured that they'd be able to expand their leverage in Democratic Republic of Congo, Republic of Congo, where they also have uh, PMC deployments, Rwanda, many surrounding countries. In addition, Central African Republic's uh, diamond reserves and mineral reserves were under international sanctions. And in the future, if those sanctions could be lifted in the United Nations, they would be very profitable for Russian companies, like Al Rosa Diamond or Bobay Invest, which is a subsidiary that's linked to Yevgeny Prigozhin, Putin's chef. So the Russians wanted to get an early access to those mineral resources. So over okay, the can, I, can I just interrupt at this point sure. and ask you, going back a couple of decades to the Soviet era, their interest in Africa, Southern Africa, mostly countries such as Angola, etc., was was political and military as well as financial. Does right. this have any echoes of that, or is it simply about getting access to the minerals, making a lot of money for uh, the country itself and for rich Russian individuals? So, uh, first of all, I think during the uh, the Central African Republic during the Soviet era, really did not have very, very close links to the uh, Soviet Union, except for a brief period under Bokasa when he was flirting with the communist bloc. But in general, I think this is probably economically driven. But I would also say that there's other aspects and other dimensions that are at play, too. I mean, obviously, having a foothold in Central African Republic could rebuild memory of the Soviet era great power status in the broader region. So there's historical reminders. And Russia, by maintaining dialogue with the Seleka rebels and Tuadera's government, has also sought to rebuild itself as a major diplomatic negotiator in the Central African Republic, which mirrors some of the Soviet involvements in the Angolan and Mozambican settlements in the late 1980s. So there are some parallels, but this is more economically driven than before. Okay, um, Eugène, I'm going to bring you in here. You happen to be in Maryland, east of the United States, but you are from the CAR. You are an expert on what is happening there. How terrible is the infighting proving to be for civilians there? I mean, at this time, uh, since the, those rebels have tried to stop the election process, they cut off the road, I mean, the main road from where we get uh, goods, so the road to Cameroon, and they have been trying to suffocate the capital where the government is uh, over there. So uh, the struggle of the population have started a long time ago, 2013, when Seleka came in the country, and has never changed. Uh, the life of the people have been threatened everywhere, east, west, north. I mean, every place that they have been there, I mean, they've been on the land, and it didn't change. And this uh, election process, because of the fact that the Constitution Court have disqualified the candidature of uh, uh, François Bozizé, he has been, uh, I mean, people think that France is also behind that. He has been used uh, to stop the election process and try to get and force a uh, transitional government. So if there are um, countless people, hundreds of thousands of people having to leave their homes, fleeing to different countries, if there are considerable number of deaths, these are not ragtag militia that are causing a little bit of mayhem. It seems very well organized. Where are they getting their backing from? Uh, their money, their, their arms and everything? I mean, you know that they occupied uh, many land, and most of those land that they occupy are diamond, gold land. So it's very easy for them to get the diamond and the gold and to be able to sell to, I mean, those who can uh, provide them the weapon. And it's very strange that we have an embargo on weapon on CAR. So that means every body on the country is not supposed to get weapons. The government, they don't, didn't leave the, the, the embargo on the government. The government has a hard time to have the right 
weaponry to fight against those rebels. But at the same time, we can see that those rebels have a free access to weapon and they can go through. I'm just going to ask you this. Are they getting their weaponry? Are they getting their weaponry from Russia or from a variety of different sources? Because if they're getting it from Russia and Russia is also providing military assistance to the government, uh, then I don't really quite know how to explain that. I mean, uh, that's a possibility, but I don't know about that information that you give because I think it's the war of communication, you know. Uh, the, uh, those rebels, the Seleka, have been on the country, the Russian were not there. They were still getting those weaponry. The weapon were coming, they have been getting there. I don't believe that Russia is going to give weapon to kill their own soldiers. And they have casualties too. They are, their people are dying at this time. So I don't think Russia is going to provide weapon to people that kill the people they have on the land. I, I think that's a game of communication. Well, let, let, let me bring that, this in, if I may. Uh, this is from a group called Aspinia Online, International Analysis and Commentary. This is something they read. I read it this morning on their website. The crucial question is whether Russia aims to be solely the supplier of small arms and boots, military, in exchange for new sources of minerals, or if it aspires to also be a mediator between the Central African Republic and the rebel armed groups to negotiate access to diamonds, gold and uranium in rebel controlled areas. So they're trying to have it always, aren't they? I mean, it's, I mean, that's that's possible. I don't say that that's not possible. That's a, a possibility. But today, I believe that the government of the CR is trying to work with the Russian to help them to bring peace in the country. It's something that France failed to do with the Sangaris in 2014 when they came in the country. When they got two guys killed, they refused to help the country. And then the, the, the French, French government through Hollande was the one that pushed... Uh, the president Toadera to go and meet the Russian, and that's the way Russian came in the CAR. So maybe those people, some of those people in those lands occupied by those rebels, are providing small arms. But today, uh, the the what we're trying to do, the country tried to get rid of those rebels because the United Nations failed to do so. Help us. We didn't have an army during uh, uh, since 2013, yeah. and we were depending on them. Nothing was done to protect the people of the Central African Republic, and I think this time. The CAR need to work. I mean, this is partnership the same way that the French helped the U.S. to get the independence or the, the Europe need the, the Russia, USSR at the time, and the U.S. to help them to get rid of Hitler. We, I mean, our government need to do what is best in the interest of its people and to secure I, I'm, the nation. I'm going to I mean, talk about the UN operation MINUSCA in just a moment and how ineffective it has been. Personally, I always feel very sorry for the sort of work they have to do there and how um, their hands are tied. But Paul Simon, let me come to you first of all. Russia and, and France, it appears from what I'm hearing that they are circling like vultures. Yeah, I mean, too much talk about that as well. I, um, I'm not sure. You know, I, I'm, um, it's true. Russia is a new actor and uh, France was surprised by the extent of Russia's um, engagement, the extent of uh, the way Russia started being influential within the security apparatus in the, in the CIA, clearly. Um, but I think that the real problem we have in the CIA today is that the country does not have a functioning army. That's the problem. And uh, neither France nor Russia have got, uh, have really helped seriously to drive the security sector reform properly. Uh, and as long as it, it doesn't happen, no matter the amount of weapon we're going to give to the Central African Army, it's not going to help. The Central African Army is not able to keep to store those weapons in a secure way. Uh, uh, you've seen the number but of. Let, let, let me just ask this question on behalf of the public, because this is a country that is rich in minerals, diamonds. We've already mentioned. There's gold. There's copper. There are countless others. It, it makes virtually no money from that for its people. It is a country where I think three to four percent only of the population have electricity. It cannot manage it on its own. No, it does. And there was a time where it used to actually, where it used to, to manage its, um, its, um, uh, its uh, mineral wealth. Um, uh, but there are several things to it. You know, uh, diamond and gold in the CER you need to understand also their geological characteristics. They are what they call 
alluvionaire in French. Um, they, are, they, they are extremely difficult to exploit in, a, in an industri industrial manner. So that's why you have literally illegal and small scale mining that's happening that lends itself too easily to uh, kind of illegal exploitation. That's why uh, armed groups have, uh, can do that. And that money does not come into the tax, um, uh, uh, the tax coffers, the state coffers in the form of tax. So yeah, it doesn't go to the people. It does not go to the to the people. That's why the country is so dependent on uh, international uh, cooperation support. Yet it's a country potentially very rich. Potentially very rich. Samuel Ramani, I want to bring in two other countries here. I mentioned France and its supposed network, um, allying some say with uh, Bozizé. Chad is also mentioned in the same sentence. So Chad and France, and then you have Russia and Rwanda. Give us your version of what's happening there, will you, with Rwanda and, and with Chad? So France and Chad have a very deep uh, uh, strategic partnership. That's partially an extension of the fact that they're both uh, having common cause in eastern Libya with regards to Khalifa Haftar. Also, Idris Deby has got a close relationship with the French government. So Chad is kind of France's anchor in the Sahel and a lot of the counterinsurgency and extremism operations, particularly now with Kita's overthrow in Mali. And some of that cooperation is now spilling over into the Central African Republic. It's unclear, I think, to the extent to which the French and the Chadians are coordinating on the ground in support of Bouzizi or in support of the rebels. I'm not convinced by those accounts. Uh, there's not enough evidence, but they definitely could be workable and strong partners. Regarding Russia and Rwanda, the uh, Russians and the Rwandan relationship has improved quite dramatically. I mean, Paul Kagame, the president, visited Sochi last year. He signed a nuclear energy deal with Rosatom. So there's a broader strategic partnership at play. And both countries were concerned about post-election violence and saw an instrumental need to converge in December. So the Russians and the Rwandans uh, ended up putting special forces together, I think in an ad hoc fashion, and now they've cooperated in a crisis setting. I think that that relationship can get stronger going forward. So I see France and Chad and R Russia and Rwanda forming rival axes, but they're still in the process of consolidation. So they're not quite axes yet. Okay, Eugène, let me come to you. Thank you very much for that. Samuel, Eugène, I want to ask you about MINUSCA, the United Nations um, Peacekeeping Force has been there for a number of years now. And I, I say I always feel sorry for them because their hands are tied in so many instances. Uh, would it not just simply be better for them to pull out and leave the people of the CAR to get on with it? I mean, uh, like you say, they've been there for a long time. And uh, the mandate was more like uh, to keep peace, but... Uh, I think in that case, the problem that we're having, they're not doing, I mean, it's not helping the reality what's going on over there. Uh, it would have been like, a, uh, I mean, a, a mandate of intervention. Probably it would have changed uh, something to disarm the different group because those groups are not that, that powerful. I mean, it looks like people don't make the best to change the process over there. And like uh, Paul Simon said, uh, our army completely disappeared in 2013. We used to have a good army years before, but without troops, the fact that they're training new troops, troops that are not used to, to, uh, to you know, war situation, it would take, I mean, a long time for us to bring back the defense. So if so, the so UN can I ask to... you this? Can I ask you this? Um, the UN are doing the best job they can. It's very difficult for them. The army uh, seems to be pretty much non-existent. Give us your take, and this is for each one of you, but I'll stay with you, Eugène, for this one uh, at the moment, is what will it take for CAR to shake off um, the past, the French colonial past, to, to please all sides, if, if you like, and be a vibrant, vigorous, and prosperous country? What is going to to be needed. I mean, the first, the first uh, things it has to you have to bring peace back in the country. You know, we we have to have peace. <laughs> Without peace, you're not going to be able to develop anything. This is a landlocked country. Uh, the post-colonial, unfortunately, the the, the colonial uh, history uh, was. I mean, didn't bring when the French was there. It was not a good educational system, so we didn't get a lot of people to to develop this country the way it's supposed to be. But the first situation here, we need to bring peace back in the CAR and to probably have partners for several years to be able to get out of that crisis. It won't be overnight, that's impossible. 
Okay, so how do you achieve peace? Let me ask you, Paul Simon. In the short term, you need to bring peace by neutralizing some of the armed groups that, who are not ready for peace. You need to neutralize them, them in a way by having a robust force that uh, on the side of MINUSCA that will actually bring uh, st help stabilize the country. But on the other side, you need political dialogue because at the moment you have a problem between, I mean, the government is at loggerheads with both the political opposition and the armed, uh, the armed groups. The government cannot allow or cannot uh, um, uh, 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 afford, actually, to be at loggerheads with uh, all its partners. It needs to actually come to the negotiating uh, table, but the armed groups need to be uh, neutralized first. On the other side, or in parallel, the government needs also to work on a development plan, because the reality is that in the CER, uh, state uh, services are absent from most of the country. They are absent from most of the provinces. You don't have state services, meaning education, hospital, uh, uh, healthcare. Uh, very, very little state presence. And, That's and, also and what, could one of the reasons. A former colonial power. Uh, could a former uh, colonial uh, power such as France help with this, or would that be seen as being patronizing and interfering? France can help, but France needs to know that the CER, the, the country's government, uh, will also need the help, the support of other countries. Okay, not... Samuel, let me, let, let me ask you this. I'm sorry to rush you, but we are coming towards the end of the programme. Uh, Russia has done rather well in encouraging anti-Franco -Frank uh, sentiment in the CAR. It's turned a lot of uh, people from that country against the former colonial power. Does that mean Russia is going to be eventually the biggest international player in the country and will take advantage both financially and perhaps politically? I think that Russia has thrived in the Central African Republic in part because it's not France. It's like the alternative. The United States has so far not engaged itself. So if the US would even engage itself minimally, it could probably maybe play a role in reducing Russian influence, but they don't have the inclination to do so. So Russia, I think, is well primed and well established to uh, seize control. First of all, it's actively challenging the UN arms embargo and the uh, embargo on conflict diamonds to its control of the Kimberley process, which regulates it through its adjudication of green zones, which allow for exports of diamonds. And when the, if those industries partially open up and the sanctions are partially diluted there, the Russians will be able to reap the windfalls economically because they're established players there. Also, they have a track record of diplomatic dialogue between the government and the opposition, which they may have diluted over the past year because they've lent more strongly towards Tuadera, Valery Zakharov, a Russian is his national security advisor, but they still have connections with other factions that they can leverage diplomatically. So all in all, I think that Russia is very well situated to win the peace in Central African Republic if the situation ever de-escalates. Eugène, let me ask you this. We're coming towards the end of, of the programme. Are, are you hopeful without outside intervention uh, that the Central African Republic and its people can achieve what you hope for, which is peace and prosperity, uh, within the next decade or so? Yeah, I mean, today we are the crossing road of uh, our future, definitely. And uh, I just heard what Samuel just say. President Tuadera need to work with the Russian and know exactly what he won't have a vision and know what he's looking for. If he can do that through Russian, with Russian, as a partner, we can get back the peace process. And as Paul Simon say, we have to have a development. It has to have a, a development program to carry out and change the course of what we have been through uh, for years. You know, sometimes when we talk here, it's like we're belonging to France. We are an independent country and we need to act as so. France is not supposed to dictate everything as they have done before. Sure. And... Today is the day for Central African Republic, the Central African people, even the political opposition in Central African Republic to understand because they are the ones that were side up with France against the government, the actual government, the country, the people of CR, they want peace. And I believe that those people need to get on the table with the president to talk about the armed group. Okay. It will be difficult to Every... negotiate with them. Because they continue Every to story I read about CAR and a host of other sub-Saharan African countries mentions the word corruption. It's um, been leveled, these accusations, both at Bozizi and Tuadera. Is there anybody waiting in the wings who might bring 
some different kind of philosophy to African government, to the CAR government. Give, give us a suggestion of a name, somebody we might look out for in the future. I, I mean, uh, you know, when we talk about corruption, sometimes we always think about Africa. But remember, <laughs> the French system has been corrupted, too, when we see President Sarkozy. You won't have time to put a name up. We understand that. But yeah. if you want to put a name no, no, up, but, but I mean, this is a future, process. It's, it's, right just, now. it's just a way to change. President Ouadra is in uh, charge of the country. I think people need to work. I mean, CR need to work on that. Corruption, we go down as long as we decide to take the best people at the best position and to be able to run the country a different way. This is not something that's going to change overnight. Totally agree with you. Listen, thank you very much indeed. Uh, I feel sorry for having to interrupt and rush things along, but we only have a limited amount of time. And you've given us your time today, for which we are very, very thankful. And uh, we're very thankful to you, our viewers, wherever you happen to be watching this edition of Roundtable. From me, David Foster, from the team that made it possible, goodbye for now. Now, we hope to have you with us on another occasion.